Good afternoon. I'm Pat Living with the Department of Health and Social Services and moderator for the COVID-19 update for Wednesday, August 5th. We are joined today by the Yukon Premier Sandy Silver and the Yukon's Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Brendan Hanley. Our sign language interpretation is being provided by Mary Thiessen and our French language translation by André Boursier from French Language Services Directorate. Following our speakers, we will go to the phone lines for questions from reporters. We will call you by name, and you will each have one question plus one follow-up. Premier Silver. Thank you very much, Pat. Hello, everybody, and thanks for tuning in. Uh, it's good to be here on the traditional territory of the Kwanlin Dun First Nation and the Ta'an Kwachin Council. Uh, we are now, as you all know, into phase three of a path forward plan. Uh, it has been a few days, uh, only a few days, but uh, we remain in a good position in the territory. I know that there have been concerns uh, following last week's announcement that two travelers uh, tested positive for COVID-19 after returning home from a trip to our territory. I know that there's been a, a lot of questions. Uh, I have certainly heard a lot from my constituents in Dawson City uh, who wanted to know more. Uh, once we uh, were notified of the situation, Dr. Handley and his team worked very quickly uh, to complete a risk assessment and to undertake contract tracing. The risk was determined to be low, and we notified the public as soon as possible and asked those who were potentially exposed to self-monitor as a precaution. Dr. Hanley will have more to say about this, uh, about the nature of last week's announcement and the current protocols uh, for contact tracing and public notification in these kinds of cases. I know that uh, contact tracing uh, is a key issue uh, that is being discussed nationally. Uh, in conversations with my fellow uh, Premiers and Prime Minister, we have spoken about the importance of contract tra tracing. Uh, it's in the news now that you can download the new contract tracing app, uh, available for download, not available in all regions right now, but uh, and so we're, we know that it's not perfect right now, but it's, uh, it will be helpful in containing the spread of the disease, and we all need... Uh, we, and we need uh, all of the tools that we can get uh, to, to uh, help us to keep a coordinated effort response to the pandemic nationally uh, and also here in the territory. So good news on the horizon as far as the app and, and, uh, and contract tracing. I want to thank everyone who, uh, who learned about the potential risk of exposure and followed the recommendations to self-monitor for symptoms. Extremely important. Uh, this is exactly how we need to prepare uh, to respond as we settle into Phase 3. Staying informed about the current situation by tuning into these updates and, uh, and checking into yukon.ca and following the recommendations issued by the Chief Medical Officer of Health, uh, including following the Safe 6 uh, in staying safe. It has now been more than 14 days since those travelers were in our territory and we have reported no additional cases in the territory. This is good news and it means our system is working and that Yukoners are continuing to do their parts uh, to keep the whole territory safe. And I can't thank Yukoners enough for maintaining the safe six. Um, it's really important that we continue to do our part. Uh, and I know that it isn't easy. Uh, this pandemic has uh, presented challenges to each and every one of us, that's for sure. Uh, the resilience of Yukoners uh, and the Yukon communities uh, is remarkable, absolutely remarkable. Uh, at the same time, we know the, uh, the response to the pandemic has taken a toll on our well-being. Um, and I'm very pleased to announce uh, that this week our government is launching the Community Wellbeing, uh, survey, uh, uh, Community Wellbeing Survey in partnership with Dr. Hanley and the Canadian Index of well-being. Now this survey will measure well-being in the territory and help us better understand the local impacts of COVID-19 in a way uh, that, uh, that goes beyond the usual social, uh, usual economic indicators. In particular, it will help us identify some of the unintended consequences of the pandemic and the overall health response so far. We want to hear directly from Yukoners about how these things are going, how things are going during these challenging times. And uh, we want, as a government, to be able to uh, improve the well being right across the territory. The survey is available online at yukon.ca, and I encourage Yukoners to take the time to complete it. We need to hear from you. Uh, the results will inform how we continue to manage the pandemic in, uh, in a way that minimizes the impacts on individuals and communities. 
We're very pleased uh, that we have entered into phase three uh, so that we can continue to uh, gradually ease uh, the restrictions. Um, as Dr. Hanley announced last week, live music is once again allowed in, uh, in bars and restaurants. Um, new guidelines for bars were released this week. Uh, as we continue to move through phase three, we will continue to monitor the situation along with Dr. Handley's team. When, uh, when we look around at other parts of the country and the world, we can see that this virus remains a very real threat. We must all remain vigilant and continue to practice the safe six, even as we return uh, to social and group activities. We also need to continue to be respectful of each other and, uh, and to those who come into our territory as well. Please remember that if you have any concerns about gatherings or uh, people being where they may not are supposed to be, please call the enforcement line 1-877-374-0425. We have a team uh, in place to investigate complaints uh, about folks that are not following the rules. We have investigated over 500 complaints so far, uh, most of which have to do with concerns about failure to self-isolate. We take these concerns extremely seriously, and we uh, have issued uh, another two additional charges this week uh, under the Civil Emergency Measures Act for failure to self-isolate. Self-isolation, as required, uh, is one of the uh, safe six, uh, but it's not a recommendation. It's an order uh, when you are required to do it. We will continue to enforce self-isolation going forward because it's incredibly important to preventing the spread of COVID-19. Aside from social isolation concerns, most complaints that we receive is about uh, transitioning through the territory. As I mentioned last week, stopping at the highway information stations is mandatory for all transiting travelers. If they fail to stop at the information stations or if they are found off the designated routes, enforcement officers will be able to issue fines. For those with out-of-territory plates who are allowed to be in the territory, uh, we have visitor decals available, and to date we have issued 123 of those visitor decals. Um, the Canadian Border Service Agency uh, also announced tighter rules for Americans entering the country to transit to Alaska, and they are providing tags to, uh, to hang in the rearview mirrors of vehicles to help with identification. These rules complement our rules about how to travel through the territory respectfully, uh, which include uh, st sticking to the designated travel route, not making unnecessary stops, and transit transiting through the Yukon within 24 hours. I want to thank Community Services Minister John Stryker uh, for working very closely with Public, Sur Public Safety Minister Bill Blair uh, and his team to ensure that the concerns of Yukoners are being addressed. Yukon is also planning to, uh, to tighten the rules for those looking to enter into their state. Starting next week, non-residents traveling by air or by land uh, to Alaska will be required to provide a negative COVID test performed within 72 hours before arrival. We have also confirmed with our Alaskan counterparts that individuals will not be turned back into Canada at the Alaska border if they do not have a negative test. If they do not have a valid test result uh, from within the last 72 hours, they must pay a $250 uh, uh, fine, I guess, uh, to, uh, to have one performed at arrival. They must uh, then quarantine until the results come back negative. The intent of the new rule is to encourage people to get tested in advance of traveling to the state. We are happy to see our fellow uh, governments uh, taking actions to help protect the health and safety of Northern residents. We will continue to work with all levels of government to ensure that we are responding to the ongoing situation in a coordinated way that protects the health and safety of Northern residents. We will continue to enforce measures uh, in place here in the Yukon to support our government's COVID-19 response, the visitor information centers in Beaver Creek, Watson Lake, along with Yukon Beringia Interpretive Center will be closing on August the 6th. Uh, 
Staff from those three facilities will be reassigned to work out of information stations at Yukon's land and air borders, where they will provide visitors with COVID-19 resources and information about how and where to travel safely, respectfully, and responsibly in and through the Yukon. Information stations are located at the SEMA border stations outside of Watson Lake, the Canadian Border Services Agency uh, stationed in Beaver Creek, the top of the, the top of the Robert Service Way, uh, top of the highway, top of the World Highway, uh, and uh, and the airport in in Whitehorse, or oh, sorry, the top of the Robert Service Way uh, and the uh, the airport in Whitehorse. My apologies. Uh, before closing, I want to commend Queer Yukon for their thoughtful ways that they have organized this year's Pride Festival. This festival was delayed from June as a result of COVID-19, and this year's theme is Remote Connections. It all kicked off last week when we raised the progressive Pride flag in front of the Yukon Legislative Assembly for the first time ever. This was an inspiring event uh, to take uh, place, uh, and uh, I want to thank uh, Minister Dendies as well for helping me with that. Um, I want to thank all of the other elected officials that were in attendance. Uh, we had uh, Minister Tracy Ann McPhee, uh, Minister Pauline Frost, Minister Richard Mostyn, the leader of the third party, Kate White, and uh, His Worship Mayor Dan Curtis as well. Uh, there is so much great work uh, going on in the territory to advance equality and to ensure that our territory is inclusive to all Yukoners. So I want to thank uh, Joe at, uh, and the team at Queer Yukon as well. Uh, the idea of remote connections is especially important uh, right now as we continue to adjust uh, to life with COVID-19. Pride Festival events continue throughout this uh, week, and I encourage you all to check them out and to join in and to celebrate. As you celebrate, of course, I'm going to remind you to practice the safe six. Uh, this remains the best way that we can all contribute to the collective efforts to keep our territory healthy and safe, maintaining physical distance, washing your hands very frequently, uh, staying home if you're sick, limiting the number of people in your gatherings, traveling respectfully within our territory, and also self-isolating uh, as required. And remember, be excellent to one another. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Premier. Uh, good afternoon and bon après-midi. And uh, yes, I'd, I'd also like to support uh, what the Premier um, said at the beginning about the uh, Yukon Community Index of Wellbeing, the survey that um, officially, I, I believe, opens today. And the more people uh, can complete that survey, the better the results and the more useful that survey will be to turn around into um, um, recognition and, and improvements in in our um, pandemic response, especially in addressing the uh, unintended consequences and health effects. The two individuals diagnosed with COVID who had visited Yukon and returned home kicked our contact tracing process into high gear at the end of last week. And the event also seemed to be something of a wake-up call for Yukoners, as most of the people who had come forward for testing since Friday have been people experiencing various symptoms, often for several days, rather than being specific contacts related to the exposures that were posted on Friday afternoon. I know we ran into some hitches in getting people to the right place to get tested for the people in Whitehorse, and we are working on processes to improve this. But overall, we have tested a lot more people uh, in the last few days than we have over the last few weeks. The work that was undertaken by Yukon Communicable Disease Control, or YCDC, in, in advance of this public notification was detailed and completed in such a way that we can say with confidence that the risk of Yukoners having been infected by either of these two individuals during their visit here was very low. And so far, all of the tests to date carried out in either Dawson or Whitehorse have come back negative. Have, there have been many questions related to how we issued this particular information that we issued about sites, and I wanted to explain, uh, to give a little bit more detail on contact tracing. When we receive notification of a positive case, we will speak in depth with the individual or individuals to find out where they have been and who they have been in contact with. 
And if we have that information, we will then contact those who are identified directly. So we will call people and advise them what to do if they are named as contacts. When locations that have been visited are identified, such as hotels, restaurants, retail stores, these are noted in case of other cases being identified that may also have been in these places. And we may also call these locations to verify if there is a potential for public mixing at these venues. A lot of phone time takes place as our nurses at YCDC and community nursing work the lines. They are like detectives ferreting out information about possible contacts. When we can define who is exposed, then we will contact people directly. And this is the preferred approach as we get the best information and protect everyone's confidentiality. When we have reliable information that spacing and sanitation protocols are being followed at hotels or restaurants or campgrounds, so there is no opportunity for public exposure, we do not identify these places as contact locations. When we have clear detail on locations and time, but not exact information on who may have been present and whether there may have been public mixing, we do a public notification. And these uh, were um, ex examples of these were the two businesses identified in, in, in the Whitehorse notification on Friday. We're very careful about naming particular businesses and do this after having conversations with these premises to let them know our plan. Posting a notification is not a reflection on the business at all. In fact, I know Integratire has worked hard to put in workplace protocols and enhance sanitation measures, as has Walmart. It is just that there was some potential for public contact at each of those locations. When we have little detail on when and where someone was, but um, but but we do have a general location, then it's a larger notification. And this was the case with Dawson, with the information we had of multiple tourist locations over multiple days. This is not our preferred option and is done when we feel that there is some risk to the public. Note that in the recent case, again, we were relying on information that we received from another jurisdiction. I know that many people have asked where these people were, names and times, but we don't have that information to give, and if we had it, we would not be sharing it unless it was necessary for identification of a risk. We've also had questions about what other communities these individuals may have visited. And similarly, based on the information we had, there were no other exposures of significant risk to the public. If there is a risk, we've committed to advising communities and the public. And while we have identified a, one community and two businesses, the risk is lower for everyone else. Public notifications are done like this when there is a potential exposure and where we don't have enough information to directly contact people. We also need to get the information out as early as possible so that people have the information early enough to act even if the information is not as complete as we would like. From time to time, we expect to have to post similar notifications. This is part of learning to live with COVID and part of the, the, the potential that we're going to see in um, where there is a risk for cases appearing. In my mind, there are a few early learnings from this event. The notification served as a reminder that when people are experiencing symptoms, they should call or do the self-assessment and arrange for testing if they screen in. It is also that we need to live as if COVID cases are already among us. I know I've said this many times and I will need to keep saying this. And I know that I need reminders myself to remember safe spacing. It's something that's unnatural for me as I like to be close to others. I like to mingle. And even while I was visiting Dawson over the weekend, I know there, there was the occasional lapse on my part and I appreciate the reminders. If we all do physical distancing most of the time, this will help to keep us out of trouble, as will our other practices of staying away from others while sick and hand washing and getting tested when advised to, as well as the other parts of the safe six. 
This is still new to all of us, and we're all having to adjust. Learning to live with COVID will take time. But I've said before, if we can follow the safe six and maintain our capacity to, t to trace and test, then our lives can return to a livable state of normalcy. And that's all for my part today. Thank you. Thank you, Premier Silver. Thank you, Dr. Hanley. We'll go now to the phone lines, and we'll begin with Doug from Shown FM. Questions, thank you. Thank you. We'll move to Philippe, CBC North. Dr. Hanley, you mentioned some lessons have been learned from this uh, incident. Uh, what, if anything, will we improve upon next time there is contact tracing and a public notice like this? Thanks, Philip. Um, I, I think one of the things is uh, prob uh, probably looking for ways to uh, maybe re reiterate in the public messaging about um, when, if you uh, if you need to get tested, uh, um, or if you don't need to get, you know, perhaps more uh, more clear uh, direction. So uh, an example might be. Um, there were many people calling that uh, did not have symptoms, um, and we were, we were not um, asking people without symptoms to, to get tested, uh, so it may have helped to clear up some information there. Uh, we were simply asking people to, to self-monitor. Um, we also uh, did not anticipate the surge in demand for testing that actually uh, did not have to do with the contacts um, or the, ex the specific exposures. But um, as I said at the beginning of my, uh, my notes, the, um, it, it kind of, uh, I think, stimulated a realization that in people who had been having some, some uh, symptoms for some days that they probably should get tested. And this was the majority of people who, came, who have come forward for testing since Friday. So I think uh, we, um, it, it led to some delays in, in getting testing um, for some of those people. We tested a lot of people, uh, both uh, um, Friday evening and through the weekend, and, and then Monday and Tuesday at the RAC, and we're, we're looking at ways to make sure that the, the RAC or, or the testing site in Whitehorse still has the capacity if this level of testing demand um, remains. Um, so, uh, so I think those were those are some of the the areas in, in sort of anticipating a, a public response. Of course, there are always un unanticipated events, um, but um, I think maybe uh, ad adapting the communications and making them more clear might might have been helpful for the public. Do you have a follow up, Philippe? Uh, yes, I wonder if you could guide us through what would happen if a case was reported in a school. Yeah, um, so so we will have yeah, written processes and we'll also be rehearsing with the schools um, ex exactly what the procedure is. Um, so really, uh, when, it, when a case is um, identified, the, the first thing is, I think, when that if there is a child in school that is sick, that a child will be um, will be kept um, in in a place of isolation within the school until until the child can um, can 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 go home um, and be in self isolation until testing uh, assessment and testing can be arranged. So so maybe that's the first thing, and and which similarly apply to staff for uh, staff to withdraw, be in self isolation, and and arrange for testing um, assessment and testing uh, where possible, and so that. That, so really, the, the first thing is to lessen the threat of contact if that should come to be positive. And then um, if, that, uh, if that case uh, turns out to be a positive, then the, the whole contact tracing process gets, in, gets into gear in terms of um, identifying, uh, identifying any, any close contacts, um, contacting those people, uh, notification to the school itself. And uh, uh, so that so that people are allowed to to monitor. I mean, really, the rest depends so much on um, is that one case? Are there are there other cases? Are other people experiencing symptoms? Experiencing symptoms um, in terms of uh, what the uh, uh, what protocols might be applied either to that classroom um, or or to the school as a whole. So so a lot of that will depend on the. On the extent, but certainly, I think we're we're trying to build in um, processes where 
as, as we do every year for respiratory disease and influenza, we, we actually do have a, a, um, a agreements and, and processes in place with the schools so that they can identify early any changes in activity, any, any higher uh, rates of absenteeism than normal, for example. So, so the, we have these early warning systems um, and we'll be again practicing and rehearsing those beforehand so that we have early, I think the, obviously the earlier that we know of a, of a case or a potential case, the sooner we can put in appropriate isolation, and that will limit the impact and enable the school to, to continue to, to, uh, to function as best as possible. So hopefully that gives you some overall idea. Many of the details will depend on not only the location and the school, but, but the details uh, of the case. Thank you. We'll move to John, CKRW. wondering if uh, around the country there have been COVID-19 uh, contact tracing apps. Has the government or the people in charge here um, considered uh, implementing some sort of contact tracing app in, in the future? So, um, yeah, thanks for the question. There, there, are, um, there are some apps being developed, and of course there is the, uh, the, the, COVID, uh, uh, the COVID Alert uh, Act uh, app, which is being developed um, as, a, as a Google Apple um, uh, collaboration uh, and, and is being uh, supported and, and promoted and funded by the uh, federal government. So the, the first phase is that this is being um, this is being piloted in Ontario at the moment. This app, this app actually is available for download, but the the activation currently is within Ontario, and it's really to learn to learn more about how applicable um, it can be and how uh, how useful um, it will be in addition to standard contact tracing. So, does it? I guess the key question is, will it? Um, Will it help separate the, the the signal from the noise? Uh, and and uh, these th th this particular app uh, relies on on Bluetooth um, notification. So ba basically, cell phones talking to each other, gathering uh, information that, in case of a positive person being identified, can then. Um, uh, be uh, serve as a notification to people who may have been in contact or will have been in, in close contact with that individual. So it's an additional aid to identifying contacts. Perhaps the biggest value might be in, in a kind of a memory jog um, for, uh, for people. Um, but uh, and and there are other variations being being developed, and so we're we're certainly looking looking with interest to see not only the development of these apps, but how do they actually work in real life, and how do how do they add value to traditional contact tracing? I think particularly in a small jurisdiction where where we have a lot of advantages in contact tracing compared to a large jurisdiction because we have we have well-known networks. It's easier to contact people, easier to find people. We tend to have very complete and very thorough contact tracing. So it remains a question of how much, uh, how much uh, added value uh, an app would bring us, but, but we're certainly looking um, with keen interest at, uh, at how these are being rolled out. Yeah, I just add to that the, uh, the the pilot project that is happening in Ontario. Um, this has been a national conversation for uh, for many months now. Uh, I want to commend Alberta. Alberta came out early on with uh, preliminary conversations with uh, tech companies. Uh, exactly for this reason to have a, a tracing app. Um, so the the national. Uh, program is being pilot project in Ontario. So that particular app, I have it on my phone now. It's available for download, but isn't used outside of Ontario. Its design is for the nation, not just Ontario. Thank you. Uh, John, do you have a follow-up? Uh, yeah. I was wondering if, um, I guess, how is... Uh, how is the territory feeling about the recent spike of cases uh, in jurisdictions nearby, mainly BC? Uh, I've been noticing more masks in and around Whitehorse uh, when traveling through stores, and I'm wondering if maybe there's possibly more concern from the government perspective, because it seems the public might be a little more uneasy. 
Yeah, I mean, we're, we're always concerned when epidemiology trends are upward as opposed to downward, uh, and we're closely monitoring this, uh, really concerned with what's happening in the States. Uh, we, we see certain countries with certain spikes as well. Um, you know, whether the conversation is, is this a second wave or is this the extension of a first wave, you know, all of these things are very concerning. And uh, our response is, as we look at the epidemiology in other jurisdictions, uh, is cautious uh, with, with optimism. You know, we are into our third phase. And as you know, this is the last phase before uh, a vaccine. Um, so, you know, it, it definitely is affecting the speed in which we are uh, um, releasing uh, new initiatives or, 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 uh, or relaxing uh, restrictions. Uh, and we will continue to monitor those situations. Um, you know, but again, you know, we, we do live in, in, a, in a great spot. Uh, you know, we have a small population, we're remote, and we have a, a population that is doing its best to, uh, to, to, uh, to try to make sure that they keep vulnerable people safe. And so I think that's what you're seeing with the masks, you know, is, uh, is people following the science, following, uh, you know, uh, where they should, uh, you know, if they're, if they're in areas where they can't maintain that social distancing, having a mask available, you know, that's just a sign. Line of, uh, of comprehensive Yukoners, uh, you know, following the science and doing their part to make sure that we keep each other safe. Uh, but yeah, we, we are concerned with, uh, with any spike in any cases, uh, but we are monitoring the situation and it, uh, it directly uh, affects the times, the timelines uh, of, of initiatives in, in phase three. Thank you. We'll move to uh, Haley at Yukon News. Hi, yeah, I had a question uh, for the Premier about the federal government's new COVID-19 infrastructure program, and I was wondering if the territory is planning to take advantage of that program, and so if there are specific projects being considered right now. This is uh, the announcement that came out today, I'm, I'm assuming you're, you're, you're mentioning? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, uh, you know, so we're extremely pleased uh, with that announcement. Uh, a lot of this is the uh, ICIP funding uh, that we've been uh, rolling out uh, into communities over the last uh, few months and into the last couple of years. Uh, and, and what we've seen from the federal government is that they've listened to the unique circumstances of the North. You'll see in there that the uh, Arctic Energy Fund, uh, Fund is now available for Whitehorse. Uh, that's a flexibility that we've asked for and received, a uh, conversation of whether or not Whitehorse is an isolated grid or not. Uh, and we, uh, we did manage to uh, convince the federal government uh, that if their true goal is to uh, reduce carbon emissions, uh, then, then please tr work with the communities, identify that uh, the northern communities are different uh, and, and remote and unique, uh, but also who better would know uh, what programs and what uh, areas to, to focus in on to reduce those emissions better than uh, the territorial government, the First Nations government, the municipal governments in these regions and uh, we're very happy to see that the flexibility that we've been looking for for Arctic Energy and for other funds uh, is available. We'll continue to uh, be uh, uh, using these infrastructure dollars uh, and continue to work with uh, the federal government on flexibilities as need be. Um, you know, there's still lots of construction that's happening in Yukon. We're very happy to see that. We're very happy to see people working. Uh, you know, it's an extremely important part of, of mental health is, you know, people being out there and working in the communities. Uh, and very happy with the announcement today because, uh, again, we, we received the flexibility that we've been looking for. Thank you. Follow-up question, Haley? Yes, thank you. Um, you mentioned mental health there. This is um, tangentially related. But um, when it comes to that survey that's going to be on UConn.ca, um, what kind of factors beyond economic growth, what kind of factors are you looking at capturing in that survey? It's a great question, and I really appreciate it. Uh, you know, in, in past years... Uh, in decades, you know, the territory kind of relied on GDP as, a, as an index of how we're doing relative to other jurisdictions. To us, uh, uh, the, the Canadian Index of Well-Being, uh, partnering with them and partnering with the universities in which they, they come from, um, you know, we now have an ability to take a look more at, uh, at, at the things that make a community well. Uh, you know, so not only the economic uh, measures, but also social measures. So uh, as you go on to that survey, it, I will say it's long. Uh, it's about, it takes about 30 minutes to to complete, so I really appreciate folks uh, getting out there and and uh, and signing into it. But it it's basically goes through the gamut uh, of you know how how individuals are feeling uh, related to COVID, but also just related to you know living in the north, living in in uh, in, in Yukon. The the index 
came out originally uh, at the beginning of the year, uh, but with COVID coming in, uh, we we we. Uh, we got about 300, 330 uh, responses to that original survey uh, of the index uh, before uh, pausing it. Uh, and now as we relaunched it, uh, it'll be very similar to those questions that Yukoners have seen uh, in, in that first survey. Uh, and But now there's going to be a version of the survey that features brand new first section, uh, which is on the pandemic uh, response that focuses on the unintended consequences of COVID pandemic and the overall health response. Response. Um, so, working with uh, Dr. Hanley and his team at the uh, at the medical office, uh, you know, working hand in hand and partnering on this uh, natural progression through. Uh, key difference to the new survey is that it's open to Yukoners over the age of 18. Uh, the first survey was restricted to a randomly drawn sample of a thousand people, uh, but now the survey is opened uh, to to all Yukoners who wish to participate in that, and uh, we'll collect the data. Uh, on this survey, uh, and we'll have a report later on in the fall, uh, and uh, Yukoners will will report on features uh, uh, that uh, um, that just an analysis of that well-being indicators, um, you know, is, uh, is is very important as we as we turn into that next phase. You know, we're being in this new normal, uh, you know, how we are going to. Uh, program and target our programs and services for health and social services is it'll be an extremely important part of uh, of that transition to uh, you know to our new health plan uh, as we move forward thank you we'll move now to Gabrielle Whitehorse star hi I have a question regarding the new rule requiring a negative COVID test um, to go to Alaska uh, first, I'm just hoping, Premier, you can clarify, you said that the Yukon is also planning to tighten the rules for those looking to enter into their state. I think perhaps you meant the, that Alaska is planning to tighten the rules or Yukon is as, as well. Uh, Canada. Uh, so, you know, as Alaska is moving forward as well, we've had uh, Minister Bill Blair talk about the, the nation's uh, uh, restrictions. Uh, and so what I mentioned was how Minister Stryker and his team here, Community Services, fed in Yukon's concerns and considerations to the national plan when it comes to our borders. Um, you know, so with Alaska specifically, uh, you know, there are new requirements now, as we mentioned, uh, for those non-residents that are traveling by land or air, uh, you know, to, into Alaska to provide that negative COVID test. Uh, and also, you know, what happens if they show up at that border uh, without that test and the $250 that have to pay uh, to get a test at that border. Uh, I'm definitely applauding the, the efforts of, uh, of Alaskans, uh, the Alaskan government, to, uh, to make sure that all the communities in the north are safe and that they're doing uh, their utmost to make sure that those entering uh, not only their state but also British Columbia and, and Yukon along the way uh, are doing so in, in, in a uh, time-sensitive manner and in the safest way possible. Thank you. Follow-up, Gabrielle? Right. In relation to that, I'm wondering if testing criteria for COVID is going to be expanded as things open up, um, for instance, allowing people to get tested before they travel, whether to Alaska or to somewhere else, um, to, to include teachers who might not have all of the symptoms generally required and et cetera. Uh, it, yeah, it's... More question for for Dr. Hanley. You know, we'll follow the the advice of the of the chief medical officer of health uh, when it comes to what type of visions we're going to be using uh, as we uh, as we lift restrictions. Yeah, I, I think I would add that you, you will see that the criteria for testing are actually very broad now, but they still do depend on symptoms. So for public health testing, we uh, we have uh, recently expanded the criteria and posted those criteria. Um, so they can be uh, symptoms that are that are. Uh, there's a large variety of symptoms, anything from loss of smell or taste uh, to a sore throat to uh, to a headache. Um, uh, you know, and, and then in context, you know, is this uh, something that is new um, or unfamiliar? Um, so, so very broad criteria. Uh, the other, the other category, though, are um, an increasing number of um, requests for tests that are uh, that are based more on third-party requests. So, verification of 
uh, test negative status even in people without symptoms. And uh, uh, um, so these are not normally covered under um, uh, under public health testing, um, but we're looking at ways that um, that such requests can be uh, can be accommodated um, because usually this is a, a, a separate stream. These these are not people that w where we are actively looking for for COVID. Um, but um, but may uh, may require for either for travel, sometimes for healthcare in other jurisdictions, uh, a, a negative test. So um, so we're still looking at mechanisms to uh, to accommodate these uh, requests that would not be uh, an imposition on the on the public health system. Uh, as a nation and also as a jurisdiction, neither Canada nor Yukon uh, requires the testing to take place to allow entry. Uh, neither at the borders uh, will require uh, temperature checks either. Uh, and I, 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 it's hard to see that changing uh, at this point, um, but uh, that's, that's kind of the direction the nation's taking right now. Thank you. I'd like to thank everyone today for their time. The next COVID-19 update is scheduled for Wednesday, August 12th at 2 p.m.